Good morning, everyone. It's so nice to be here again with you. Our Saturday morning live organized by the United States Spiritist Federation. And today we're going to have our special guest, John Santos, who is going to be talking about God and universal cosmic fluid. And uh, before we start and get John with us, we're going to do our special prayer. Everything is special being with you. So my name is Tanya Schwartz from the United States Spiritist Federation. So let's close our eyes and let's uh, get ready to prepare this uh, morning and the inspiration, asking our spiritual friends to be with us, to embrace John, to embrace all of us who are here together this morning to learn and to get from them all the love, all the care that we all need to open our minds and our thoughts and our hearts to get these messages and put in practice in our daily lives, having God always in our lives and being thankful for everything that we have. Thanks and please be with us. So now that we prepared, we're going to see John. Hi, John. How are you doing this morning? Good. Good morning, Tanya. Good morning, everyone. Nice seeing you. Thanks for being with us. But before we ask John to start and bring in the words of wisdom today, we're going to introduce him formally to everyone. Uh, so John... Santos has been involved with the Spiritism for more than 14 years and is an active member of CER Atlanta. He's also a volunteer worker at Spiritist Radio. Professionally, he's a telecommunications engineer. John lives in Atlanta, Georgia, with his wife, Sylvia, and their daughter, Sophia. So again, thanks for being with us. And uh, I want to remind everyone that John is going to be talking, and at the end, we're going to have questions and answers. So make sure to send your questions throughout the talk. Okay, now the word is yours, John. Thank you very much. So it's, uh, as I mentioned to Jusara, first of all, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. To me, it's an honor uh, to be uh, doing a, a public lecture for the U.S. Spiritist Federation. And I actually have no idea of the outreach of, of these lectures, like how, how many people and countries are watching us at this time. But to me, it's, um, it's, it's a mission to all of us to spread this knowledge so other people can enjoy what we enjoy. So to start, we're going to talk about God and universal cosmic fluid. So let's start with God. For anyone who has some uh, sensibility to look around um, and see in nature, the wonders of nature, it doesn't have to be something big, something small like your the plants on your, your backyard or little animals or like a cobweb that I, that a spider creates. As since a child, I have always been uh, wondering <laughs> how they do something so beautiful and so accurate, so precise. So for Anyone that has that sensibility to observe the creation will realize how great God is, that there is this supreme intelligence, the creator of all things, behind everything we see in nature. However, for many centuries, as human beings, 
throughout our evolution, we, we put God in a different place. We actually created the image of God being an old man sitting on a throne, um, deciding about everyone's lives, having sides, having hands, having a beard, gray hair. So, but in the 19th century, with the advent of Spiritism, presided by the Spirit of Truth, and organized, coordinated by Allan Kardec, we have been invited to change our, our thought, to actually climb the ladder of evolution, you know, a few steps as far as religious thought, to better understand what is God. Even though those, the religious thought of the past had been useful to us, it no longer fulfill our needs. As we can see nowadays, many people question the existence of God. Many people choose to be atheists, materialists. In many situations, it's because they disagree with this image of God of being a man. So basically being our image, as opposed to us being his image as a civilization, we made God our image and limited as we are. So, if we go into the Spirit's book that was published in 1857 by Allan Kardec, and once again, Allan Kardec conducted this, the greatest interview of all time, asking questions and sending out questions throughout the world to other Spiritist groups so that they could ask the highest spirits and gathering those answers, compiling them, looking at those answers um, statistically to see what, what the truth looks like. So the first question of this book, what is God? First of all, the question itself shows the wisdom of Allan Kardec. The question is not who is God, it's what is God? Because if you ask who is God, you're already assuming God is a person. But no, his question was, what is God? The answer, God is the supreme intelligence, the first cause of all things. For spiritists that are watching us, we all know this answer. We all understand what that means. Supreme intelligence. That is no one, nothing more intelligent than God. And the first cause of all things, it means that everything that's created is created by God. First cause of all things. So, if we continue in, in the Spirit's book to understand um, a little bit more, and again, we talked about some people that negate the existence of God. So it came question number four. Where may we find proof for the existence of God? The answer in an axiom, you apply to all your sciences. There is no effect without a cause. Again, looking at 
nature. Look at the marvelous things that are created in nature. Look at the seasons of the year. I like to tell people that no one will invite uh, friends to for a Christmas event and say, we're gonna wear shorts, flip-flops and t-shirt in the Northern hemisphere. Because all of us know for sure we'll be cold. We just don't know how cold it's gonna be and depending depends on where you live. But we know it's going to be cold. No one will sign up for an outdoor event uh, with not enough clothing at the time of Christmas. So we know it's gonna be cold, but sometimes we doubt the existence of God. We, a lot of times we look around and we don't realize the greatness of God. I mentioned the seasons that we have throughout the year that we know they're gonna happen, right? There are other movements. And to me, it's always wonderful to imagine our solar system that has been orbiting, like planets orbiting around our sun, just to speak about our solar system, not even to speak about the entire galaxy or the entire universe. But isn't that wonderful that these planets are moving, they're not colliding, and they, their movement is constant because the seasons of the year, they happen at the same time every year. So in order to put some picture to this, we'd like to show a, a quick video just so you understand um, that we, we actually look at a simplified version. We learn in school a simplified version of um, the Earth's movements. And we look at Sun as this star that is static, not moving. And only the planets are moving. But it's more than that. Because the planets are orbiting around the Sun. And the Sun, the galaxy, the, the solar system is orbiting around the galaxy center. And this our galaxy is also orbiting around the nebula center. But without further ado, let's play that video uh, of the helicodal model showing our solar system.
So I hope that uh, everyone can see what a lot of us see, just the wonders. And again, that's just a tiny bit of the universe. We can think our solar system, even our galaxy, is like a, a grain of sand in this beach called the universe. So continuing on our journey to understand God. So Alan Kardec in question 13 asked about the attributes of God. He asked, when we state that God is eternal, infinite, immutable, immaterial, one, all powerful, and supremely just and good, don't we have a complete idea of God's attributes? We're saying eternal, that there is no beginning, no end. Infinite, as far as everywhere, immutable, because of course, God can change. His laws cannot change. Otherwise, there will be no harmony in the universe. Immaterial for the same reason. Because I, I don't know about I don't know about you if you noticed, but matter changes. I mean, throughout these years, looking at the mirror, I I can tell from, from myself, I see matter changing around me. All powerful, supremely just and good. Oh, we all know inherently that God is, is just, but sometimes we doubt that God is good. Supremely just and good, or infinitely just and good. Just pause for a second now. Try to think of someone that is a good person, someone that's very good. Maybe you can think of Mahatma Gandhi, Buddha, um, for the Brazilians, Francisco Xavier, um, Mother Teresa, or someone that's unknown to most people, someone close to you. Could be a, a relative or a friend that you know you have seen what they do and how good they are. People that we see sometimes in our spiritual center that we look up to them as models to us. Because if if Jesus, who is our guide and model, is too far out there, sometimes we resort to someone that's closer to us. But imagine someone that's very good. Maybe it was the mother, our grandmother, this person's goodness compared to God's goodness. It's like comparing a glass of water with the ocean. Even though this person is very, very, very good, God is supremely and infinitely good. So going back to the question, don't we have a complete idea of God's attributes? So when you look at all these attributes that we're seeing on the screen, don't we have a complete idea? The answer, from your point of, of view, yes. Because you believe that in so stating them, you therefore have named all of them. So we think we know all of them. Nevertheless, you should understand that there are things that transcend the intelligence of the most intelligent person. Things your language cannot define because language is limited to your ideas and sensations. For those who speak more than one language, very likely most of us have gone through situations where we want to express an idea in that from one language into another language. And sometimes we have a hard time expressing that idea.
from one language into another. Like how, we, and sometimes we use many words from one word that you have in one language. You go and use a lot of words in another language. As an example, between English and Portuguese, the word deadline, as far as I know, like we use that word a lot at work, but in Portuguese, I don't, I don't recall. We kind of say, well, prazo. Prazo means time, like how much time do I have? It's different than deadline, right? One thing is you have, if I say your deadline is November 14th, that's the deadline. Now in Portuguese, well, you, we say you have seven days. That's your prazo, if you will. That's the time that you have to do the task. And I'm sorry if I don't remember, but that's just an example. It's a word that sometimes I stumble through when I'm explaining something in Portuguese, you know, from English to Portuguese. But there are many other examples of, of words or expressions uh, or idioms from one language that you try to express in the other language, and it's it's hard. Uh, and in the spirits book, the higher spirits many times tell us about this limitation we have, limitation of language. As an, another example between this, the spirits and us, um, and some people say that Alain Kardec is outdated because you use the word fluid. And we're gonna get there. Universal cosmic fluid and some others that's also called fluid. Um, back then, magnetic, electric, they were called fluids. Nowadays, we don't call them fluid, right? We call energy, field. Um, but at the time, if the spirit said, universal cosmic field, Alain Kardec maybe will ask, Field, you're talking about like, like a like a sports field, like. So back then, they couldn't use that word because it wouldn't be understood. So a lot of times we we judge things with the knowledge we have today, without thinking how they were back there. But back into question thirteen, so they say. Things your language cannot define because language is limited to your ideas and your sensations. Your reason tells you that God must be perfect in those attributes to the nth degree. For if God lacked any of them or was not perfect in them to the nth degree, God would not be superior to everything else and thus would not be God. In order to be superior to everything else, God must not, must not be subject to any change and must not be imperfect in any way immanageable. Well, we hear this answer humbling to us. And then we wonder, can humans know the origin of things. We like to say, any question we think, Kardec asked, in some way, shape, or form. So that was his next question. Can humans know the origin of things? The answer is no. On earth, God does not allow everything to be revealed to them. The attention on earth. This is a humbling answer. To incarnate, there is a limit to our investigations. But then we, we will look into the next question, question 18. Will they ever be able to grasp the mystery of things now hidden from them? Can we ever, will we ever be able to grasp the answer? The veil is lifted as they become more and more purified. But in order to understand certain, certain things, they need faculties they do not yet have. So we're not prohibited from understanding, God understanding the origin of all things. 
We're just are incapable. That's why I said pay attention. Said Earth. Earth is a planet of trials and tribulations. That is a number two in the scale of five. That is where there is more evil than goodness. There is only one behind us. It's the primitive world, like Earth used to be. Imagine Earth going all the way back thousands of years ago. No electricity, no internet, no smartphones, no computers. There was no wheel, no engine. Primitive world. We evolved. But we have a lot more to evolve. We have three more levels. The next, regeneration. So that's why to me it's very important when it says on earth, because it's our level of understanding. It's not there yet. But on question 18, it says that this veil is lifted as, as we become more and more purified. Question 21. We're going to start getting to the universal cosmic fluid. Is matter eternal like God, or was it created at some specific time in past? Think about this. Alan Kardec is, is really trying to understand, is God the creator of all things? Is the origin, is, is the beginning, or was something before God? That's why he asked that question. Is matter eternal like God, or was it created at some specific time? time in the past? The answer, only God knows. And nevertheless, there is something you should realize by using your reason. God, the very personification of love and charity, has never been inactive. God, the very personification of love and charity, has never been inactive. There is so much, only on this phrase, Never being inactive. It reminds me of John chapter 5, verse 17. My father is still working, and I'm also and I'm working also. That's when Jesus healed on a Saturday. And the Pharisees criticizing and saying Saturday is not is a day, is is a is a day for idleness, basically, right? It was not a day. You, you're not supposed to work. You're not supposed to heal. You're not supposed to do anything. And Jesus was showing that his example was the father, was the creator. And not only that, but in that phrase, God is the very personification of love and charity. Do you think your mother loves you very much? I'm, I'm sure for most of us, the person who loves us the most it's our mother, right? We, we grew in the womb, or even not, can be um, an adopted mother as well. But there is so much love. Those who are parents, we know, no matter what our children do, we're going to love them. Yes, we are, because we are imperfect. Sometimes, yes, we, we, get, we get frustrated. We may get mad at them. But we don't stop loving them. We don't stop loving them. Now, God, the personification of love and charity. Like the other day, I was talking to a friend exactly about this topic of the hard job of being a parent. And with the knowledge we have, because I, 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 I tell some close friends that if I, was a, if I was a parent 20 years ago, before um, spiritism, I would not be 20% of the parent I, I am today. So thanks to spiritism, um, I know, like, because the, the spiritism teaches us as, as it's always said, that we must always preach and speak sometimes. Francis of Assisi said that. 
We should preach the gospel always and speak sometimes, which means preaching the gospel with our behavior, with our example. And we know that our children they imitate us. They, they do that. That's how they learn the most. And sometimes they, they get on under our skin. And this friend tells me, imagine God. It took me two or three, maybe three times until, you no, know, he said that a few times. And then I got it. He was trying to tell me, all right, you're having a hard time with your child. And it's only one. Imagine God, who's the parent of all of us. And it's not only 7 or 8 billion or 28, 30 billion spirits total on this planet. We're not just talking about this planet. Can we imagine God's love for never stopping loving us? Never putting a child on the side. Because the God that we're talking about here is not that God from the Middle Ages. The God that we used to believe in past incarnations. The God that had sides. A God that will be cheering for one on another candidate in our current elections, if you will. Or a God that cheers, that supports the same team that you support in any sport that you prefer. A God, that's, that's not God per our understanding today, our understanding past the 19th century, that is spiritism came to review to us. The spiritism came to review a God that doesn't have a beard, doesn't have hair, doesn't have hands, doesn't have a mouth. Not a human, not a human like God. And someone may ask, well, if God is not human-like, how can we be his image? Well, are we really this body? Or are we a spark of light as a spirit? And then God is this infinite, big spark of light when compared to us. So, we talked about the attributes of God. And when we go to Genesis, according to Spiritism, chapter 2, item 19, Alan Kardec, after talking about the attributes, says this, the perfect religion will be the one in which not one article of faith contradicts those qualities, and in which all its dogmas can bear the proof of the test without being affected. So it has to be aligned with those attributes. And quite honestly, even for us, as spiritists, sometimes we get distracted and we go back to that God, a human-like God, a God that is not good enough or is not just enough. Sometimes we are impacted or we, we receive something that we, it goes against our desire and we wonder, did God send you the wrong address? Like it was supposed to go to my neighbor, not come here. So I, I, I was delivered these, let's say a disease or anything, any struggle. But God is the very personification of love 
and charity. Charity. If you go to question 886 of the Spirit's book, what is charity as understood by Jesus? Benevolence, indulgence, forgiveness of offenses. Benevolence is acting with goodness, having the intent of goodness. Because not every time our acts, our words, are 100% good, have the intention of the goodness. Like when we speak with sarcasm, irony, we don't have the intention of, of goodness. We're, we're not having a benevolent act. But a benevolent act is charity. We tend to think that charity is something we can see, we can touch. I, I, can, I can give a jacket, I can give socks, soup. That's also charity. That's material charity. But the essential charity, as it's called by Emmanuel, the spirit mentor of Francisco Xavier, is the charity that we can't see, that we can't touch. Is love in action, love. Can anyone touch love? Can you give me a little bit of love in my hands? You can't. But we can give love. We can feel love. God is the very personification of love and charity. Has never been inactive. It, it ends that idea that God created the loss and is now sitting back, sitting back on his throne. Just let the loss work. Let people live according to this loss, or if they go against the loss, they suffer. No, God is, is active. So when we when we pray. We're talking, pray to God. We're talking to a being. There's the personification of love and charity. Sometimes we misinterpret God. But let's do a comparison. Sometimes you go through a pain, a struggle, and we may think God is not being just. That maybe we don't deserve that. I'll resort to the parents as well. Again, or those who are not parents, think about your parents. When a child is sick, the parent takes the child to the doctor. The doctor says, I need to give this injection. But the parents say, no. Is the injection something pleasurable? For those who have, who have children, and have gone through the first vaccinations, you know how painful it is. We all know. I don't think anybody says, I like to, I like to have someone stick a needle in me, an injection or a vaccine. I don't think anybody really likes that. But isn't that injection a medicine for your child to heal the child? Aren't most of us now in the Northern Hemisphere taking the flu shot, although it's not, we don't go and take the flu shot because it's a pleasure. It's because we know it's good for us, for those who go and take it. We know it's good for us. So sometimes we mis misinterpret God's intentions. But God is the very personification of love and charity. That was part of the answer in question 21. Question 22. Matter is generally defined as that which has extension, that which can impress our senses, that which is impenetrable. Are these definitions correct? So now remember, we have to go back the 150, 163 years, or maybe 64. This was about 1855, 1856, when Alan Kardec was asking these questions. How was matter known? Even the atom, if we, if we go back, what was known about the atom? 
The atom was one piece. We didn't know about electrons yet, protons, neutrons. So we believed back then that in order to be matter, to be considered matter, it has to have extension, something that you can measure, that can impress our senses, that we can feel, we can touch, we can see, and it's impenetrable. You can't pass matter. So he asked, are these definitions correct? The answer is from your point of view, they are correct because you can only talk about matters that are familiar to you. Matter, however, also exists in states that are unfamiliar. For example, it may be so ethereal and subtle that your senses cannot detect it. It is matter nonetheless, even though you do not perceive it as such. Nowadays, we know other states of matter, like plasma. We know the sun, for example, right? And we know that an, an atom has mass, it's matter. Electrons, that's part of the atom, is matter. For example, right now, you that are watching, watching us here, through YouTube, through Facebook, it doesn't matter. Uh, how are you watching this? We have electrons, right, going through, over here going through fiber, and <clears throat> depending where you are, you go through the public switching telecom network, may go through a satellite, may go through submarine cables, but it's, it is matter moving. It's much easier nowadays to talk about this than it was in Kardec's time. Because you can be on the other side of the earth right now watching us. Back then, imagine if we told, if we went all the way back and told Kardec and others, say, believe me, we're going to be able to talk to each other across the planet and be able to see each other. Someone would say, well, you're, you're crazy. That's not possible. It was about, by the way, it was about the same time Kardec was, was starting to organize spiritism that we had James Clark Maxwell writing the formulas of electromagnetism, which you're going to get here in a few minutes. So he goes, Alain Kardec goes and asks in question 23, what is the spirit? the intelligence principle of the universe. Spirit of lowercase s, the intelligent principle of the universe. So anything that's spiritual, right? Because in question 76, then we'll talk about spirit as human beings. In 27, so there are two general elements in the universe, matter and spirit. So he realizes now that is matter and matter is not all that we know. That is more to that. Even nowadays, like, we, do we know what is dark matter? Basically, what science cannot explain as far as matter is called dark matter and represents 97, 96% of the universe. So it's something we don't know that we're still investigating. But Kardec asked in 27, so there are two general elements in the universe, man and spirit. Yes, you got one right. Finally, we got one right. And over everything is God, the creator and author of all. These three elements comprise the principle of all that exists. They are the universal trinity. However, to the element of matter, must be added the universal fluid, which plays an intermediary role between spirit and matter per se, since matter is too dense for the spirit to act upon it. Although from a certain point of view, this fluid may be regarded as part of the material element, it differs from it, from it due to a special property. If 
it were simply matter, there would be no reason for a spirit not to be matter to. It is placed between spirit and matter. It is just fluid. Just matter is matter. In its countless combinations with matter and under the direction of the spirit, it is, in, it is capable of producing an infinite variety of things about which you still know very, very little. By being the agent upon which spirits act, agent, matter, this universal, primitive, or elementary fluid is the principle without which matter would forever remain in a state of dispersion. You would never acquire the properties given by its gravitation. So, there is a spirit, that is matter, and God above all things, the creator of all things. This is called the universal trinity. So that defines, that's the principle of everything we know in the universe. In question 28, Kardec makes a proposal. Since the spirit is something in and of itself, wouldn't it be clearer and less subject to confuse, confusion to label these two general elements as inert matter and intelligent matter? He wants to call his spirit intelligent matter because he's saying spirit is something. Spirit is not made out of nothing. It is something. The answer, words not, do not matter much to us. It is up to you to formulate your language in a way that you can understand one another. As I mentioned, they remind us many times about words. What's important is the idea. The idea. So, in 29, is ponder measurability or ponderability an essential attribute of matter? So, should we be able to measure matter? Of matter as you understand it, yes, but not of matter considered as universal fluid. The ethereal and subtle matter that forms this fluid is imponderable to you. And yet it is very, it is the very principle of your own ponderable matter. So we can't measure the universal cosmic fluid, but we can measure other matters that they are formed from the universal cosmic fluid. So I like to say, think of, Think of a cake as an example, right? Cake is made out of wheat, right? Um, so it has gluten. A cake made out of wheat, we say, all right, I have this cake, it has wheat. Is that the raw wheat? No. All right, then I get the bucket, our bowl. I have wheat flour. All right, this is, this is, raw this is comparable to universal cosmic fluid no what was this flower before oh it was whole wheat flour okay this is the raw stuff no it was actually the seeds right which that's captured in nature so you see we get the seeds of wheat we modify into flour, modify into refined flour, and modify into baking. It's the same principle. But the only difference here is that we can measure wheat. We cannot measure the universal cosmic fluid. And in question 36, he asked, is there an absolute void in any part of the, of the universal space? And the answer is no, there is no void. What appears to you to be a void is actually occupied by matter that cannot be detected by your senses or instruments. Nowadays, we know we have dark matter that we still don't know, we can't really measure. That is also, there was a study, a theory, and, and, and then experiments to prove this. Science has already proved this. It's called the Casimir effect. On a high level, we'll summarize quickly, but if there was a theory 
So you put two mirrors and you in vacuum and you start putting them close to each other. When they are too close, they attract each other because there are waves around it that push, that push the two meters. So they what what they say is we far from being empty. So more, more than physicists assume that a vacuum is full of fluctuating electromagnetic magnetic waves that can never be completely eliminated. So there is something there for us, for us to learn, right? Now, in, in the book, Heaven and Hell, in the book, Heaven and Hell, Chapter, chapter three of part one, uh, entitled Heaven, Kardec points out a couple mistakes that we have done as civilization. So the various doctrines related to the dwelling of the blessed, blessed all rest upon double error of regarding the earth as the center of the universe. Because remember, like there is this concept that heaven is above, but above what? If we say above from Earth perspective, it could be below from another planet perspective. There is no up or down in space. So, and limiting the regions of the heavenly bodies. It's interesting, we learned that God is omnipresent, but then we're saying that heaven is a limited place. So then it would sound like a God is only there, is not in other places. So he points out, and when you go to um, Genesis, according to Spiritism, uh, chapter 6, Uranography, it's a chapter that was, um, it was written, by the spirit Galileo Galilei through the medium Camille Flammarion. Flammarion, he was a, an astronomer when he was 16 years old. So then he helped, he became friends with Alain Kardec because he realized that his studies and Alain Kardec's studies were aligned. So, um, and he helped write this chapter. So Galileo on item 10, chapter six says, there is a, an ethery, ethereal fluid that fills space and penetrates bodies. This fluid is the ether or primitive cosmic matter or universe, universal cosmic fluid, the generator of the universe and beings. Inherent to this ether are the forces that preside over the metamorphosis of matter. Remember, we talk about transformations of matter. The immutable and necessary laws that govern the universe. These multiple forms indefinitely varied according to the combinations of matter, localized according to the masses, and diversified in their modes of action, depending on the circumstances and conditions are known on earth as gravity, cohesion, you know, the forces that keep the atom together, affinity, attraction, magnetism, and electricity. Galileo is affirming that these forces are in the universal cosmic fluid. And he, he continued, on other worlds, they manifest under other aspects and display other characteristics unknown on this one. So there are other forces that we don't know. If we think about this, for example, gravity, 
we know from studies, we can watch the movies. You see, for example, astronauts um, on the moon, they're jumping. There is gravity there. It's the same formula, but because the mass of the moon is smaller, it's, it's, it's smaller gravity. If I'm not mistaken, it's five times less than the gravity we have here. So that means it's five times less force to keep us on the ground. Galileo on item 19 also says, up to this point, we have remained silent about, silent about the spirit world, which is also a part of creation and fulfills its destiny according to the Augustus prescriptions of the Lord. Concerning the way in which spirits are created, I can provide only a very restricted teaching due to my own ignorance. So Galileo, on the spirit side, spirit world, he's also saying, you know, ignorance here meaning he doesn't know, you know, he, he's, he's, his knowledge is limited. And moreover, I must keep silent regarding certain issues, although my I myself have been allowed to delve into them. Keep silent. Again, we're not gonna we're not gonna teach quantum physics to a six-year-old. We're not gonna teach triple integral in elementary school. So there are things he's saying, there are things he can't teach us, right? Now, when we go to chapter two of Genesis, this chapter is called, is entitled God. For those who haven't read Genesis according to Spiritism, this is the cover that you see on the slide. Um, this book, a lot of people think, ah, it's about the creation of earth, uh, it's about science. Um, no, it, this book is about God. It starts with chapter one. It's, it's kind of a re recap. Comes chapter two. It talks about God. And how can we understand God? It was the beginning of this talk. Look at the creation. So then go from starting chapter three and onwards, talking about the creation, explain the creation. And also explains um those healings that Jesus Jesus also did talks about talks about the time of transition that we're going through now. But going back to, to chapter two, item twenty, providence is God's care of all creatures. Remember, God is love and charity. So it says, God is everywhere, sees everything, and presides over everything. Even this very, the very smallest things, this is what providential action consists. But then Kardec asked the question that some of us are thinking at this, at this moment. When we hear presides over everything, even the very smallest things, first presides over everything. So God is the president of the universe. Has always been, will always be. Kardec asked, how is it that God, so great, so powerful, so superior to everything, can get involved in the tiniest details and can be concerned with the smallest acts and thoughts of each individual? Such is the question that unbelievers ask themselves, from which they conclude that even if they were to believe in the existence of God, God's action would extend only to the general laws of the universe and that the universe has functioned throughout eternity by virtue of those laws to which all creatures are subject in their sphere of activity without there being any need for incessant support of providence. Remember we read in the Spirit's book, God is active, right? That's what Kardec is pointing out here. Some people have a hard time to, to understand. And he continues on item 21. In their current little evolved state, humans can comprehend the infinite God only with difficulty. We have a hard time understanding uh, God. Since they are bound and limited, they imagine God to be bound and limited. 
they picture God as circumscribed being and create an image after their own, creating a man God. We play that video, the little video, just to show our galaxy, our solar system translating around the center of our galaxy. Like we don't relate things. We see the seasons of the year passing by. We don't realize that they, they we don't, we don't really pay attention that they repeat every year that it was calculated and was put in this way so we can have the type of life we have in this planet. And we know the next year is going to repeat and the year after, the year after. We know because there is a supreme intelligence. Now, in item 22, Kardec says, talking about the universal cosmic fluid, let us imagine a fluid subtle enough to penetrate all objects. Being unintelligent, this fluid acts mechanically by material forces alone. So if it is a fluid, it will act mechanically just by forces. However, he continues, if we imagine this fluid to be endowed with intelligence, perception, and sensitivity, it no longer acts blindly, but with discernment, will, and freedom. It sees, understands, and feels. The universal cosmic fluid is the, the medium of thought of love. Of God. As we mentioned, in the way that you're watching us now, we have what? We have fiber optics, we have HFC, a hybrid fiber coax cable, we have satellite, we have submarine cables that allow us to communicate in the universe that is the universal cosmic fluid. That is the medium for the thought and love of God. So when we understand that, that's how we understand that God is omnipresent. God is everywhere. God is feeling every atom of your body. God observes you and is in constant communication with you. So after understanding this, at least myself, I stop praying like looking up. But why, why am I looking up? God is not only there, God is everywhere. So I can just pray for myself. God is everywhere, God is listening. Some of us had breakfast this morning. Maybe some people had lunch. I don't know if it's time for dinner in some places. But the right question to ask is, does God know what I ate for breakfast? That's not the right question. Actually, the answer is, God was in every atom of your breakfast. Because it's everywhere, through the universal cosmic fluid. Now, I know it may be hard to understand um, why, how, can we have, and using this word as well, right? Fluid. I know it's hard to understand. Um, now, think about something. I'll give you a few seconds to think about something that is around you, but you can't see and you, can, you cannot touch. Something that we know that we can measure. Anyone want to post comments to say, What's around you right now that you can't see, you can't feel, but we know we can measure. We know it's around us. Even for us, for regular people who don't have the instruments to measure what I'm thinking right now, you have proof that that is something around you. 
All right. On this slide, on that slide, I'm talking about electromagnetic fields. Most we use Wi-Fi. If we could see Wi-Fi, that's what it would look like. We don't realize every day we're using Wi-Fi and it's around us. We're also using cellular systems. That's what it would look like if we could see electromagnetic waves of cellular systems. But we don't see them. We can measure them with instruments, but we just, we, we, we forget, we take it for granted, right? Now, make an analogy. Actually, I'll tell you something better. Your carrier has some dead, dead spots. We know that, right? Our carriers, our cellular carriers, we go to some places, we don't have coverage. Now, here's the breaking news to finalize. God's carrier has infinite coverage. Universal cosmic fluid is everywhere. So with that, I think I'll turn over to Tanya. Wow. <laughs> Oh, John, that's so great to think that way. I was so enlightened to, to bring all that a lot of food for thought and uh, so much for us to learn, to study, and more than anything to feel, right? I mean, I felt so, so blessed, um, even though we always talk about God and God, but this definitely brought us a, a a different perspective, a very important perspective. Thank you so much. We do have some time for questions. If uh, you allow us, we'll, we'll yeah. bring some comments or questions. So let's see. Um, I think, uh, so let's start from a, a very easy one. Uh, from Glaustio, hi Glaustio. Uh, please explain the difference between fluid and field. Why did Kardec use the former term in the 1800s? <laughs> All right. It's a question from an engineer to another engineer. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully I will understand too. <laughs> <laughs> well, we kind of touched on that. Um, so uh, he used the word fluid, as, as, as I mentioned. We didn't have the words energy and field yet at that time, right? Um, so, and fluid is something that's fluidic, right? It doesn't, as, as we know, we can think of gases and, 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 and liquids. You can put them in a container. They take the form of the container. They take the shape of the, con the container, right? Different from something that's solid, that it has its own shape and you cannot reshape it or, you, or it will be harder to reshape it. So fluid is easy to shape. Um, at that time, electricity, electromagnetism, they were, they were being developed, they were being discovered, if you will. And they were called fluid at that time. It was the electric fluid and the magnetic fluid. So later we learned that's more a field, just like I showed in the, in the previous picture, like in cellular system, you have, people say tower, you have your base station and each sector is radiating energy throughout a certain distance, throughout a certain field. But nowadays, um, yeah, we don't want to revise on Kardec, but if if we were to, I think if Kardec, if Spiritism was being uh, written nowadays for this specific item, universal cosmic, I think he would use the word field. Interesting, I mean, initials would still be the same, right? For for the pure spirit as well, uh, we don't want to get much into that, um, but the pure spirit also is a field around our spirit, right? Well, hopefully that answers. We actually touched on that earlier on as well. Now that, that's great. Like you said, the, importance, the important part is the essence. It is the, 
the understanding of the lesson. It, sometimes we we get a little stuck in the terminology. So let's uh, understand what it is and kind of bring it on, right? Continue to understand. The concept is there. It's good. Yeah. Okay, we have another one. So when you say sometimes we doubt God's justice because of all the injustice we see on earth, would you say reincarnation has a role in God's justice? Definitely. Um, in chapter 5 of the Gospel according to Spiritism, um, they teach us that talk about our afflictions, right? And basically, if I have... If I'm going through a struggle, some affliction, um, I need to look back and analyze. If I don't see in this life that I have done something to have that as a result, like I don't see the cause of that effect, then it will be in, in a past life. Um, we sometimes, as, as an example, talking about reincarnation, we may have people in our families that we have hard time you know, it's, it's a relationship that we have to work hard to maintain, um, to develop. Um, but a lot of times it, it is because we, in the in a past life, we did something to each other. And that's why there isn't much affinity in there. And now we're here to develop that affinity. Sometimes we see that between parents and children, for example, right? Because it's a way um, the spirits use, the higher spirits use to finally develop acceptance um, or love. As an example, one does a story of a woman that act, after a lecture by Divaldo Pereira Franco, went to talk to him and she said, well, I know we, we need, you know, um, we need to plant our seeds and, and, and maybe also I have to expiate with this husband of mine, he's, he's hard to deal with but I'm not going to divorce him. I'm going to stay with him through the end so that I'm done, right? And, well, Divaldo has um, very ostensive mediumship. So his mentor, Joanna D'Angeli, was close to him and told him something to tell her. said, well, Joanna is here. She's telling me that in this life, you're learning to stand him, right? So you can, you can stand him but you're gonna come again in another life, his wife again, to learn to love him. <laughs> yeah, well, that's true. Very different things, you know, tolerate and, and just go by and, and love, it's uh, two different things. And it's true, you know, the, definitely think about God's justice in this infinite justice. Uh, it's uh, close to impossible to think looking around and just that one life we can get all done. That's, uh, you know, uh, very easy, at least to, for me to to see how reincarnation has everything to do with this, this justice. So thank you. Mm -hmm. I think we have more, yeah, a little bit more time. So let's go and see this next one. When you say God creates continuously, does it mean that there are other new primitive worlds being created in the universe that we are not aware of? We can, from our level of understanding, we can suppose the answer is yes. And science keep discovering. If, if we look at a picture of the space from 100 years ago, we, call, we only knew about our galaxy. Our telescopes had only photographed our galaxy. Now, it just, just later, do this research just to compare what have we seen so far, what our telescopes um, have gathered so far, 2020, and go back 100 years and compare. It's amazing how much we keep discovering. Again, it is infinite. It is infinite. There are trillions of stars, of galaxies. Scientists also say, you know, talking about civilizations or inhabited worlds, um, they say there are about 1% of, of planets that are like ours. I mean, even from their perspective, there has to be life in other planets. 
And not only that, in the Spirit's book, I can't remember the question number, but there is a question that Kardec asked about, is it about the law of destruction um, and progress? Ask about if planets, they also have a life and will be, you know, one day uh, will die as we die, as, you know, as the body dies. The answer is yes, just mm -hmm. like our body dies and, and go back to uh, universal cosmic fluid, the same happens to planets. So all the time, God is creating and th there are planets, stars that are, that are dying. And that matter is going back to universal cosmic fluid to then feed other, other planets, other um, stars in the future. All the transformations, right? It's very humbling to, to think that way. That it's not because we haven't discovered it that we don't know that is not happening. It's not there, right? I mean, that touches on our our pride. Uh, even accepting God uh, in the, the form and shape, whatever we can think of, but the superior being and the creator. It's uh, it's um, it touches our our hearts definitely and our intellect too <laughs> a lot to learn right so let's see we have uh, one more oh we have some uh, more questions is it possible from robson santos is it possible to see god in all marriages <laughs> <laughs> tricky <laughs> yeah it's uh i'm also laughing because he put that uh that emoticon at the end there well <laughs> I, I believe it is because in all marriages, yes, I can I can tell you um, I have some you know we, we we work here there are people from different countries um, and I know people in certain countries they have arranged marriage so um, it is different than the way we typically do here in the West right where we. We try and we, we believe we found the one. That, so we first develop love and then we get married. They do the opposite. They get married and they believe they will develop love. And sometimes it seems to work, but God is everywhere. And even sometimes, again, remember the example of the woman that asked the question to Devaldo Franco? So for her, that marriage is from her perspective, is an expiation. But there is God there, as also the example of the injection, right? So some, sometimes we can look <laughs> and, and we think, oh, that was not, that's not a good match. You know, they keep fighting. Well, I remember an example of, of um, um, a couple um, in, their, in their 70s or so, and one time, the husband was in the hospital and, and the wife was sad. And it was a couple that was always, always fighting and screaming at each other. So then um, someone asked this woman, like, why are you sad? Because you know, the one that you keep fighting is not here now. <laughs> you should be happy. No, she said, I'm sad because he's in the hospital. I like to have him around. So yeah. even though it looks like, it may look like hatred to us. It was actually love, right? Even hatred. Sikut Xavier says hatred is second love. Like we know through mediumistic meanings, talking to spirits that are deaths in, 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 in hate, that actually down there is love. Well, like you said, uh, we... You know, we are learning everything that is happening in our lives. If we take the way and we see God, we see God everywhere. That's true. If in the hard relationships, in the good ones, and all learning is uh, is possible to to see uh, God there. If we if we are open for that, right, John? It's uh, definitely. And Robson is uh, thanking you. This is very profound, brother. <laughs> That's that's great. It is. It is. Uh, we have some uh, uh, Marcia Bennett says, I trust Kardec teaches us that the opportunity for us to evolve 
will always be given to us until we find a way to dominate our negative passions and move towards virtues. Thank you, Marcia. And we have one more. Thanks, John. We have proposed a perspective that sure makes us feel closer to God. That's true. That is true. A lot of good comments and questions. And I'm sure that we have more questions that uh, we are running out of time. So we'll let you, at this point, John, uh, give us your final remarks. Leave us with that wonderful perspective of God that you're bringing to us uh, in so many ways that we still need to uh, so much to evolve and to learn and to uh, keep knowing more. The more we know about uh, the creation, the closer we get you know, to God. So it feels that way. So if you can give us your final remarks, and if I may ask after words right after if you can close with the final prayer for today and leaving all these great things for us to think about i really appreciate all right so i have an idea if you allow me there is a poem that uh, we translated um so i didn't have time to read it i think this, this poem summarizes so i use what about an hour and i think i think still there are questions out there but this poem summarizes this entire hour. That is the beautiful of art, right? That's the beauty of art. So um, it's a poem that is in the book Beyond Grave Parnassus, or in Portuguese, Parnaso de Alentumulo, um, by, it was psychographed by Francisco Xavier. And this is by the spirit Augusto dos Anjos. The title of the poem is Cosmic Matter. And it says, glory to, to the cosmic matter, the potential energy which gives life to the elements, base of prodigious movements where form ends and begins itself, systematization of arguments which clarify teleology. Within the cosmic matter, the primal source of knowledge is created. It is the world's hidden elementary force, the divine ether, where God records the history of the destiny, of his deeds of love, in love immersed. Book where the incomparable creator records with venerable and impenetrable thought his poems of beings and universes. So wow. to me, that summarizes. And I saw we had a lot of more questions to answer. So hopefully this poem helps <laughs> answer some of those questions. Um, we did our best to translate. Hopefully it sounds the same way that it sounds in Portuguese. Mm -hmm. But uh, once again, I thank you for the opportunity of being here and personally to me talking about this topic is talking about the way I found God because in two times of my life, I doubted. I was questioning, is there a God? And I gave up. I thought, no, there's no way I'll find God. And through his spiritism, I found God, which is this way through scientific studies um, that feeds our brain but also warms our hearts. So the Promise Consoler helped me and I hope help everyone to find the true God, that God is pure love, that is actively, that is active in our lives. It is within us. So with that, let's now talk to God to end this talk. God, supreme intelligence, creator of all things, we thank you for the opportunity you have given us to be here together in this morning. We thank you for our lives, for being incarnated during this time of transitions, 
at the peak of the time with this pandemic because we know that if you have allowed us to incarnate at this time, it's because we have a purpose. It's because we can bear these times of conflicts. We asked to help us, to inspire us to be sources of light, to be spreaders of hope and consolation. May your blessings in the form of petals of light invade every home right now, evolve everyone watching us, incarnates and discarnates. Let everyone feel this peace. Let everyone feel that they are your children. So be it. So be it. Well, thank you so much, John, for this uh, very inspiring talk to all of us. And uh, we invite everyone to continue watching every Saturday at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, our special guests. Every week we have a great one. And next week we're having our friend Marcelo Medeiros, and uh, he'll be speaking about gossiping in the times of Jesus and now, a spiritist view on social media. So let's uh, stay tuned for next week as well. Again, thank you for joining us. Keep safe and uh, we'll be together soon again. Take care. Bye-bye, everyone.